Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. RVing, traveling by recreational vehicle, has exploded along with the coronavirus pandemic the past couple years. Sales have gone through the roof, inventory has been depleted, and would-be customers often have to wait months before they can hit the road with their brand new rig. This is Kurt Repencheck, your host at National Parks Traveler. Many, if not most, of those RV enthusiasts are heading into the national park system. And why not? Gorgeous scenery, inspiring landscapes, relaxation. But it's not as simple as it used to be because of that rush to hit the road with your home, either being towed along behind you or on the back of your pickup truck. To look at some of those issues RVers have to contend with, we're joined today by Renee Agredano, who, along with her husband, Jim, have been full-time RVers since 2007. As you might imagine, she is pretty familiar with the challenges of enjoying the national parks by RV. We'll be back in a minute to get Renee's advice for RVing in the parks. The Everglades Foundation, the only organization whose sole mission is to restore and protect America's Everglades. Learn more at evergladesfoundation.org. Whether it be strategy, business planning, change management, board development, executive search, or diversity planning, Petrero Group is here to help. They mix a depth of experience in the parks and land space with a breadth of best practices from other industries. For more information or to schedule a preliminary conversation, go to potrerogroup.com, P-O-T-R-E-R-O, group.com. Nova Scotia. 8,000 miles of coastline dotted with colorful fishing villages, quaint coastal towns, and an abundance of scenic natural beauty. Home to two national parks, Cape Breton Highlands and Kajimakujik. Spend your nights under a canopy of twinkling stars. Spend your days exploring trails, beaches, historical waterways, and tons of cultural and recreational experiences. Visit NovaScotia.com today and start planning your natural getaway. The Yosemite Conservancy helps visitors connect with Yosemite through adventures, volunteering, and the arts. It's the only nonprofit dedicated to supporting Yosemite National Park and funds grants to improve trails, restore habitat, protect wildlife, and inspire the next generation of nature lovers. Learn more at yosemite.org. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. Show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. All right, we're back on the road with Renee Agredano. Renee, where exactly are you today? Today, I am near the Salton Sea in Southern California, hiding from winter. It's a lovely 70 degrees here, sunny, gorgeous, a little bit of wind, but I can't complain. Sounds horrible. Where, where are you heading? <laughs> well, we're, we wait out winter in, in this area. And then like we do every spring, we head north to somewhere that's going to be a little bit cooler in, in the spring and summer. Uh, snowbirds, huh? We are. Yeah, we fell into that category quite a few years ago when we decided to just slow down and not travel as much and, and stay longer and enjoy different places. Nice, nice. Now, what prompted you guys to turn into full-time RVers back in 2007? Well, it was our dog. And we are crazy dog people. We had a dog named Jerry who was diagnosed with terminal bone cancer. And the vet said he had six months to live. And we were at this point in our business where we were just like, you know, it's time for something different. Let's, let's figure out what we want to do. So being that Jerry wasn't supposed to live very long, we put our house and our business on the market and we sold it in about six months. Hmm. And at the end of that six months, Jerry was still around and we had a new RV and truck and we hit the road with him because we wanted to just give him a, a farewell road trip, if you will. And that dog, he had so much fun on that trip that he lived for two more years. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It was amazing. We took him from coast to coast. He had never been back East and we, we took him and, and he just kept going. So after two years, yeah, we said goodbye to him. What kind of dog was he? 
he was a German shepherd. Oh. And he was a three-legged German shepherd. So <laughs> he, uh, he lost his leg to, to bone cancer, but that didn't yeah. stop him. You know, he still, he got to swim at Acadia National Park. It was, it was amazing. Yeah. So, so when the cancer did finally come back, like the vet said it would eventually, we just said, you know what, let's keep going. This, we like this lifestyle so much that we both work online and we just decided to keep doing it. Why did we need to stop? So that's, that's us. And I can't believe how quickly the time has flown. We're still doing it and we still enjoy it. That's amazing. That's amazing. It sounds um, carefree. I'm, I'm sure it's not as carefree as it might sound to some folks. And we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. What size rig did you start out with, with Jerry? Well, let me tell you, we were hardcore backpackers before Jerry got sick. So we were the people who would go to national parks and pitch our tent and then point at the RVs and laugh and go, oh my God, those aren't real campers. Um, but when Jerry got sick and we knew we wanted to do this road trip, we thought, well, that's going to be the best way to travel with him. So we bought a 24 foot fifth wheel. Now, 24 feet when you're a tenter is like a mansion. I mean, that's huge. For most RVers, that's not huge. But for us being brand new to the game, it was awesome. It was great. And we got into so many parks with that particular size. So we spent seven years in that 24 footer. Was it, was this a, a towable or was it just a, a compact RV unit? Yeah. So it was a, a fifth wheel trailer. So that's kind of sit in the back of the pickup truck, you know, you tow them along. And one of the reasons they're so nice is they have so much more maneuverability, especially in park campgrounds, which tend to have really curvy roads, low trees, that kind of thing. But 24 feet was just right for the three of us. To some people, that would have been way too crowded, but we loved it. And then seven years later, we, uh, we moved up and we got a bigger rig, 27 feet, and that's Ooh. where we're at today. <laughs> yeah. Three feet made all the difference, by the way. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be sure to, to point this out to my brother-in-law, Flint, um, because he is hoping or planning to retire later this spring from his teaching career. And he and his wife have been out looking for, for fifth wheels. And um, they've, they've done a lot of traveling in the past, but usually with a pickup truck and they'd sleep in the back of the pickup truck. And the RV experience is, is such a, a significant change or upgrade, depending on how you look at it. It is. It's huge. I mean, the ability to have your own kitchen and your own restroom and your a, a real mattress. What? I mean, <laughs> something you didn't have to blow up every night. Um, it was great. And, and we still, we love it. So it's just, you know, it brings the, the best of living in a, a conventional house on the road with you. There's always a trade-off. And we found that over the years, we, we can manage those trade-offs and we still enjoy it. So RVing for us has worked out really well. That's amazing. Um, I'll definitely have to put him in touch with you so they can get um, some of the nuances. But but as, as glamorous as it sounds, I mean, um, I, I hear where you're coming from being a backpacker and laughing at RVs because I used to be a very avid backpacker and um, I, I moved into um, paddling, canoeing and, and kayaking because it's certainly easier on your back and um you can haul more stuff, and uh, I've been thinking myself about getting a, a pickup truck with a camper um, just for, you know, you pull into a campground and it's snowing or it's raining and you don't want to pitch a tent and crawl into it. I know I spent uh, a long night in Wind Cave National Park a few years back when the, the thunderstorms forced me about, I don't know, 6 or 7 o'clock into my tent where I spent the next, you know, 12 hours, you know, not being able to stand up or anything like that, and so... Yeah, I look at those RVs kind of enviously myself, but at the same time, there's issues that come along with them, right? I mean, you know, your truck could break down because you're pulling something for that's too big, or you could get a flat tire in the middle of no place. I mean, what's what's the unglamorous side? Oh my God, where do I begin? I think it it all it all starts with how you choose your rig. So if you choose a, an RV that suits your lifestyle, your your budget and your vehicle, if you're towing, you know, you'll start out with a, with a much smoother path than if you just decide to listen to the RV salesperson and get what they suggest. So there's a lot of research involved. And as we went along, we learned some of the trade-offs of having an RV and especially RVing in national parks, like a smaller rig is better. And yeah, there's many times where I would have loved to have a 
a big old fancy motor home, you know, a 40 footer, that kind of thing, but it, it really limits you on where you go. So some of the harder lessons that we've learned on the road are um, always, always, always have roadside assistance coverage for RVs. And you can have the best vehicle in the world, but if you get a blowout in the middle of Nevada and you need help, um, not everybody's going to want to tow your RV to the nearest garage. So if you're in the middle of Nevada and you break down, how long do you have to wait for that roadside assistance to show up? (laughs) (laughs) Well, we waited so long, we gave up and changed the tire ourselves and limped into the nearest uh, service station. But yeah, no, it's a long time. We actually broke down once in the Yukon. And had to wait overnight. We did. We were up in the Yukon, hit a hit a uh, frost heave, busted a leaf spring, and had to detach the RV on the side of the Alaska Highway while we were watching out for grizzly bears. And then drove into the next town, and it happened to be Canada Day weekend, so everybody was gone. And we <laughs> we literally had to wait overnight for somebody to bring a low boy tow truck over to come and get our RV and take us five hours back to Whitehorse. So wow. there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of little things like that because basically you're towing your house and you're putting it on these roads that will beat the heck out of it. No matter where you are here in, in California, the roads are awful. So um, I think you just learn to pack really carefully. You learn to have roadside assistance and um, not be in a hurry. That's the other big thing. Just don't be in such a hurry because these are huge vehicles to be moving down the highway. Well, let me ask you this. If you're towing a fifth wheel, you're kind of limited to where you can go, aren't you? I mean, in, in terms of campgrounds, you can't say, hey, there's a really cool road that climbs up into the high country. I'm going to tow my fifth wheel up there. Absolutely. You can't just slam on the brakes and decide you're going to make a, a right turn into some gorgeous spot. Um, there's a lot of pre-planning. If you don't want to do any damage to your vehicle, I think our first two weeks on the road, we, we scraped some tree branches in a forest service campground because we just <laughs> made the mistake of driving right on in there without doing a walk around first. So you always learn to, to do your research about where you're going. I don't like to do too much research, but I need to know enough that you know we're going to be okay if we pull into that campground. Fifth wheels have a lot more maneuverability than, say, a travel trailer, a, a bumper pull trailer. But still, you know, we're tall. And our RV isn't really even that tall compared to some that are out there, but there's still a lot of of obstacles that can get in your way. So you just take things very carefully and slowly. Yeah. You know, um, just recently, the folks at uh, Gulf Islands National Seashore put out a news release about um, knowing how big your RV might be, because I guess they've got some uh, overhanging trees on some of the campground roads and, um, you don't want to bump into them. And one of the comments we got on the traveler was, why not cut down the tree? Um, funny you say that, Kurt. That's funny you say that because when we went to Acadia, we watched a gentleman in a very tall fifth wheel trailer stand on the top of his trailer while his partner drove slowly through the campsite as he took a tree pruner and cut branches so he could fit there. I kid you not. We saw that happen. Yeah. Did the ranger see it happen? No, no. Did you tell the ranger you saw it happen? (laughs) (laughs) You know what? I think we were actually leaving that day. It was way back when we first started. It was like 2008, I think. So I can't recall. But yeah, we have seen crazy stuff. And I think a lot of the problem, too, is that people, people's wheels will come off parking apron. So they will dig into the, the ground beside the, the parking platform. And that does a lot of damage. Yeah, the, the, the National Park Service is working on updating um, guidelines or design guidelines for, for campgrounds in the park system. And I, I noticed in some of the documents that they, they referenced that um, trying to maneuver some of these big fifth wheels, you know, people will drive off the existing pavement and so they're the, the guidelines are talking about you know we need to enlarge these areas um i know with the uh, the advent of the, the rv sales the past two years and and the size of rvs that there's also been a, a call for um i guess bigger campgrounds in the national park service and the national park system 
and I'll be I'll be curious to see what happens. I know once upon a time the Yellowstone superintendent told me he would not build new campgrounds. Um, so we'll we'll have to see what what happens with that. And I hope to learn more in um, the coming days and weeks when. I get a chance to discuss this with the National Park Service. We're talking today with Renee Agradano, who, along with her husband Jim, has been traveling um, the country as a full-time RVer since 2007, thanks to their their old German shepherd, Jerry, who convinced them it was time to sell the house and hit the road. We'll be back in a minute with Renee to discuss more about traveling the National Park System in an RV. Wild Tribute is lifestyle apparel founded for our parks and public lands. We donate 4% of our proceeds to support America's most wild and historic places. This is our Wild Tribute. Together, we can and will make a difference for the parks. You can learn more at wildtribute.com. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to raise private support to deepen everyone's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It is also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That is why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people, inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. In addition to some of the best rates in the country, Interior Federal Credit Union gives back their members more than other financial institutions in the form of dividends and low or no fees. With higher dividend rates, you can earn more in all your accounts, like certificates, money markets, or even a checking account. They focus to make sure that their members aren't being nickeled and dimed every time they make a transaction. That's the beauty of Interior Federal Credit Union. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the national park system for decades to come. See their successes at gtnpf.org. We're back with Renee Agredano talking about RVing in the national park system. Everybody's going to ask this question, Renee. How many parks have you guys visited? I need to count. I really do. We've been to a lot. I have my passport book. I have so many stamps in there. And we've been to many parks multiple times. Uh, I will admit that most of the parks we've been to have been from uh, been west of the Mississippi. Sure. Um, East of the Mississippi, we just don't have as much fun RVing out there. I mean, there's some, oh, why not? Well, they've got these low bridges that were built like in the 1800s and um, <laughs> crazy roads in the Appalachians. And, you know, I, it's just a lot more relaxing out here. But you raise you raise a, a good point about there's a, a big difference between RVing east of the Mississippi and west of the Mississippi. And I guess that can entail those winding country roads, um, the, the pressure on your rig by hauling up uphill and, and breaking downhill um, and just swallowing all that gas with all that uh, contours. Yeah. Well, in our case, we're a, we're a diesel powered vehicle, but uh, yeah, there's also the the flow of traffic that really, really gets to us after a while. Everything just moves so quickly through there. And, you know, when we were in Acadia, now that I think about it, I remember we just kind of blew down 95 to get to Florida because it was fall and it it was back in our early days of RVing when I didn't realize that campgrounds actually closed for the season. <laughs> I'm a West Coaster by by birth and so I just, you know, I assumed campgrounds were open all year everywhere you went. So as things were shutting down, we just kind of scurried south, but yeah, it, driving out there is completely different and it's just um it's it's a challenge for sure. You put a lot of wear and tear on your vehicle. 
Yeah, but I bet you that roadside assistance is a little bit closer. Oh yes, definitely. So is internet access, by the way. It's a lot. It's a lot easier unless you're in West Virginia. That can be tricky. But yeah, it's uh, conveniences are, are much closer together out there. Do you have any favorite parks that you guys like to go back to? Oh man, that's a tricky question. You know, I I would say Big Band is our absolute favorite. It really? just kind of, yeah, it just encompasses everything that. The Cottonwood Campground. Yeah, you know, we stay at Rio Grande, and I will tell you why. Because Cottonwood, there are no generators allowed. And we work online, and we have solar, but sometimes we need to work a little bit late, and our generator needs to kick in. But, um, yeah, it's just Big Bend is so vast and gorgeous and beautiful and laid back. You really have to want to go there, and when you get there, the, the reward is it's totally worth it. Yeah, you can't get there from most places. Yeah, exactly. It is epic. We love it. Yeah, I've, I've heard it's a beautiful place, and it's on my to-do list. You mentioned generators, and I must say that um, my wife and I, a year ago, um, spent a couple nights at Capitol Reef National Park in the campground in Fruta, and it drove us crazy. Yeah. The, the generators coming on all night long and, and the furnaces coming on. And I could not believe it. I agree a hundred percent. And what I like about big bend is that there are segments of the campground that you can stand where they're generator free zones. And there's quite a few parks out there that do that. Yeah. Um, through to campground, we've been there actually, my husband proposed to me at Capitol reef, but the, yeah, the campground is really tight and, I don't like listening to generators and I, you know, we really try not to run ours. So that's why we have a really robust solar system on our roof, but yeah, it, to have to be in a tent, especially and live next to somebody running their generator. It's pretty annoying. I wish that they would um, segment out generator sites more than they do now. Yeah. And I know, I know some parks try to, and I know these new guidelines from the park service call for that specifically, you know, this loops for, you know, rigs with generators and this through loops for for tents only I'll, I'll be curious to see if there's going to be any effort to retroactively go back to some of the national park campgrounds where they don't have that uh, separation and and decide to do it i mean it sounds like it could be simple uh, along the same lines you know we're talking about 21st century campgrounds and, and upgrades there has been talk well why not just put you know full hookups so you don't need that generator running Ooh, ouch. No way. I am totally opposed to that. You know, because. I think I, you know, full hookups are great. I have them right now. I love having them in winter when we're in one location for a long time. But when you go to a national park, the whole experience is to get closer to nature and full hookups, you know, they can keep you inside. It's, it's too easy to get comfy and not want to go exploring when you've got AC or a furnace running and you just don't want to put on a coat and go. So I, I really, I don't think we've ever stayed in a national park with full hookups. We've had electricity at um, Black Canyon of the Gunnison, but that was, yeah, it was. Talk about being out there. (laughs) That's an awesome park. It's great. But we were there in, in March or April. It was freezing. There was snow on the ground. It was really nice having electrical. So I think that, is the most I would I would want to see at any campground that develop new sites. Interesting, interesting. Any specific challenges you would you would alert would be RVers to, or newbie RVers even. You know, the biggest one I can say is just don't don't even think of going to a national park without reservations anymore. Just, I mean, unless there's very few out there. Like Death Valley is one of them, but even at some times of the year in the winter time like when they have their 49ers days, it gets so busy there. So I learned a really hard lesson when we showed up at Yellowstone in the middle of October, not too long ago, and we couldn't get in. We couldn't get in anywhere. And, you know, there's a lot of RV spaces at Yellowstone. Mm -hmm. There was nothing open. So that's the biggest lesson uh, is is do your research and make the reservations. I, I like to be spontaneous, but that's just not possible anymore. Yeah, that's uh, that's one of the sad things. Um, uh, reservations are uh, a, a two two bladed sword, in, in that it does affect spontaneity. Um, but at the same time, you know, if I want to go down to the Needles Campground in, in Canyonlands National Park, that's a five hour drive. Do I want to make that drive with the hope that there might be an open spot, or do I want to make a reservation? Um, 
I know it's a, a problem the Park Service has been juggling with, and um, some people say that Recreation.gov has solved that problem. Some people disagree. And I guess you run into problems with Recreation.gov because I can't imagine you have fiber optic internet connection. <laughs> Um, if I'm in the middle of nowhere, getting online can be a challenge. So sometimes visiting a park can take weeks, if not months of planning. And, you know, as far as reservations go, um, when Big Bend went to all reservations, I was kind of relieved about that because we would drive out there. That is a long drive from anywhere to get yeah. there and hope that there's a space for you. And the last few times we went, we cut it close. We got like one of the last three sites in, in Rio Grande campgrounds. So um, I, I was kind of happy that they did go to reservations only. Um, I think there's just a, there's a fine line, you know, and, and nobody wants to drive all that way and, and get turned around. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's gotta be challenging. You know, one of the things you've been working on for the traveler, uh, Renee, is a, a comprehensive chart of just about every campground in the park system that takes RVs. And we're, we're not going to say it's officially a complete chart of every campground because you're bound to miss something once you say that. But, um, you know, anything that has jumped out to you, I mean, you're, you're covering everything from how many campgrounds there might be in a park to how many RV spots there might be to whether there's got hookups or whether there's showers or whether there's dump stations. Has anything jumped out at you that made you say, huh, What's the deal with that? <laughs> what hasn't? Um, first of all, uh, the wide variety of ways in which the Park Service describes campgrounds. Um, for example, uh, if you were looking for an accessible campsite, uh, something with a, a longer picnic table to fit a, a wheelchair user's legs underneath, you're going to have a, a tough time trying to find really accurate descriptions. For example, um, one park might say, we don't have any ADA sites, but the campground is relatively flat and easy to get around in a wheelchair. Well, what does that mean? So I think that, you know, as an RVer, I'm, I'm just looking for really basic stuff. I want to know if my RV can fit, if it's even allowed to go in there, because in some locations, the roads are just too tight and they will tell you motorhomes only or, you know, travel trailers not to exceed 25 feet, including the trailer, which is kind of ridiculous, like a tent trailer you're talking about. But yeah, the biggest surprise uh, was the lack of ADA accessible descriptions. And um, just, you know, it's it, the descriptions are all over the map in general. So mm -hmm. you really have to do your homework about where you want to go. Yeah. One of the things I think that's going to be invaluable with um, your work that you're putting in is that one size does not fit all. There are um, quite a range of, of camp sites in terms of how big your rig is. I mean, from time to time, we, we get emails at the Traveler, you know, I've got a 35-foot or 40-foot rig, you know, is it okay to take that to this park or that park? It, there is no uniform uniformity to it, is there? You're exactly right. And what a lot of people don't consider is the manufacturer will list the, the size of the RV, the length. You know, I have a, an officially 27-foot uh, fifth wheel. But I have bike racks on the back and then I have a, a spare tire mount and then there's the truck and how long is your truck? And every, everybody just needs to know their RVs, full measurements, top to bottom, end to end. You need to know exactly how long you are so that you'll fit in there. So one size does not fit all is exactly right. I, I guess um, it'd be impossible for, for each and every park to say, OK, we're going to have 50 sites that fit an RV at 45 foot and we're going to have 20 sites that, that fit a uh, 30 footer or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, when, when you get done with this and I, I know you have gone through more than 150 campgrounds in the park system. Cause I counted, well, actually you counted them up cause you put them in a nice Excel sheet that marks each and every single one of them. Any advice for the Park Service if, if you could give them advice on how to design a RV-friendly campground? Oh, my gosh. Uh, uh, boy, I would say uh, landscaping, landscaping, landscaping. I, I love the natural environment. That's why I live this lifestyle. But when you put a boulder next to the end of a campground, uh, a campsite itself, you're asking for trouble. Our truck has this lovely gouge in the right quarter panel because the park service put this 
beautiful boulder at the end of our campsite. Well, that that's intended so you don't run past the end of your campsite. That's in these guidelines. They they mention boulder placement. It's terrible. And I don't have a large RV, Kurt. My, mine is really small. So, you know, I guess it, it really goes back to the RV owners out there. If you want to see the national parks, you're going to have to think small. And I know a lot of people don't want to hear that, but these mammoth RVs that are being built right now, they are not park friendly. They're just not. So when you say small, would what would you recommend if I wanted to sell my house and, and hit the road full time? and visit every national park that I write about? Small would be, gosh, to me, this is large because I have a 27 foot RV. But um, if you keep your RV 30 feet or less, according to the manufacturer's size, you would be okay in a lot of parks. There'll still be a lot of campgrounds that you can't get into, but you might have alternatives in other park locations. But RVs in the 40 foot range, forget it. Your, Your choices are slim. Interesting. Uh, I'll pass that on to my brother-in-law because uh, I think they were looking for something bigger than 30 foot, but maybe I'm mistaken. Well, Renee, it's been great talking to you today about uh, National Park campgrounds and RVing in general. It sounds like a, a great lifestyle that you guys have, although it must be hard to get your mail. Oh, that's actually the easy part. That's not that's not too bad, especially now that everything's practically digital. The only thing I get in the mail are things I don't really want, like uh, jury duty summons and that kind of thing. <laughs> But really, I mean, you guys are traveling the road all the time. I know you have a, a post office box or something in, in Texas, I believe, isn't it? Yeah, we use a mail forwarding service from Escapees RV Club. So they make it really easy to be a full-timer. And they handle our mail and send it to us when we need it. Really? And how do you decide when you need it? I call them and say, what's in our box? Or I email. Or, you know, they have a new scanning service where they'll scan all of your mail. But I just, I just give them a call. You know, my son told me that the, the post office will do that for you, too, for free. They'll, they'll scan your mail on a daily basis and send you images so you know, oh, I need that, or no, I don't need that. I have heard about that. I haven't looked into that, and I'm not really sure I want the post office looking at my mail. <laughs> so. Well, it might be better than a stranger, but, you know, you mentioned something that, that piqued my interest. I mean, it sounds like you have a pretty good support network out there to, to help um, – with a wide variety of issues that you might come up with. Oh, absolutely. The RVing community, even as much as it's grown, there are still a lot of organizations, clubs, Facebook groups, uh, all kinds of sub communities within RVing that are there to help one another and, and really make this lifestyle more enjoyable. You, you don't necessarily have to be a lone wolf traveling out there all by yourself. Sure. But then, but then that company that you said that handles your mail, I mean, um, what was it called? So Escapees RV Club. They're actually, I think they're probably one of the oldest RVer clubs out there. And they were actually started by a couple in their 40s who started full-timing with their kids back in the early 70s. And uh, it's mostly a, a volunteer-run organization, but they do have a pretty strong administrative staff that does everything from look out for RVers needs um, on the, the legal front, because, you know, as you probably know, there's a lot of places now that are cracking down on overnight camping for RVers and that kind of thing. So uh, I'm a big escapees RV club advocate. So is there a, a, a central place folks can go to find these companies or whatever that, that will help them out? Or is it just a matter of uh, asking Google? Yeah, you know, Google Google is your friend, uh, I think. Um, as far as a central place for RV clubs listed, I think any organization like Good Sam or, or Woodalls will have them in their directories. Well, Renee, it's been a lot of fun talking RVing with you today, and, and we're certainly looking for the, the completion of that chart. I know it's uh, quite voluminous, but I think it's going to be an incredible resource for RVers who want to not just hit the road, but, but get into the national park system. Oh, thank you, Kurt. It's been really fun. And, and I'm doing it for my own selfish reasons, too, because I'm, I'm making my list of, of parks to check out, especially ones on the East Coast. All right. Well, thanks for joining us today and safe travels on the open road. Thank you. And that's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. And for those RVers listening to the show, keep an eye on The Traveler for a comprehensive chart of national park campgrounds that can handle RVs. It'll be coming later this spring. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series. 
that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Park's Travelers podcasts. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. Editing and production work for the National Parks Traveler podcast is done by Splitbeard Productions. You can learn more about us at splitbeardproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit nationalparkstraveler.org.